Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Straw Hat Goofy with another review for you guys. And honestly, it's it's Spider-Man No Way Home week. And we, we're, we've been talking Spider-Man No Way Home a lot. i just been kind of holding off on the spoilers because I wanted to give people a chance to actually go out, see the movie, and then, like, you know, I talk spoilers and that way it's not hurting anybody. Now, I feel sorry for the people who have to see the movie next week or the week after, but... To be honest, like you can't expect us to not have the conversation about one of the biggest movies of the year and, you know, wait two weeks till after that conversation is over. Like, no, we're not going to do that. So what I'm going to do is it's Sunday right now. I'm going to make this video and then I'm going to post a video Monday morning. And that way it gives everyone a chance to have seen it over the weekend. Right. And I feel like that's a fair amount of time to like start talking spoilers, because if you haven't seen it over the weekend, then, you know. I think it's a every a huge majority, a huge population have already seen the movie. So you should already be kind of like, you know, off of social media and things like that. But this is going to be a spoiler heavy review. And I'm going to make it pretty quick. Like I, I have like things that I want to talk about. Uh, I have my favorite parts. I'm going to break down some of my favorite callbacks, uh, some of my favorite, my favorite thing about the movie, because it's very hard to talk about Spider-Man No Way Home without talking about spoilers. So it's pretty much going to be like the spoiler free review. It's just that I'm going to add like a little bit more spoilers to it, add some theories in there for good measure. If you're still here, you heard me say spoiler a hundred times get out of here well, i've already said that spider-man no way home is probably it has the argument to be the best movie the best spider-man movie of all time like there's a legit argument for that and the reason why i say that is because similar to into the spider-verse right it uses multiple spider people uh in this case spider men to pretty much show you that peter parker spider-man what it means to be that character right what makes this character so unique in the pantheon of other heroes and things like that and one of those things is his relatability his sense of uh responsibility his sacrifice uh just pretty much all those things no matter what universe peter parker comes from they all share the same kind of like code the same morals right in terms of like this movie it uses previous spider-man uh franchises and it says no matter if you like andrew garfield more if you like toby Maguire more or if you like tom holland more all these characters still share the same thing and a lot of people will call that fan service a lot of people will call that uh uh, some people will say like, oh, it's just this based off of nostalgia. I don't think so because I don't think it sacrifices nostalgia. I don't think it sacrifices a good story and a good message and good themes in order to just go for nostalgia. I don't think the nostalgia compromises that at all, right? So when it comes to uh, obviously like the argument, like the argument of who's the best Peter Parker, who's the best Spider-Man, I think this movie officially deads that in a way that Into the Spider-Verse couldn't because one, Into the Spider-Verse is an animated film and for the most part it introduces Spider-People to general audiences that they haven't seen before. If you read comics, you've seen them before, but if you are just watching the movies, then you didn't know who Spider-Ham was, you didn't know who Spider-Man Noir was, Penny Parker, Spider-Gwen was introduced for the first time to a lot of people. But this film, reintroduces spider-man that we have seen before these spider-man have been part of the cultural zeitgeist like if you grew up with toby or even if you didn't grow up with toby you know who toby mcguire's peter parker is andrew garfield everyone knows who that is tom Holland, everyone knows who that is and so they took the conversation of who's the best and they pretty much said no one's the best i i really like that that of the movie like obviously you have like the you have the differences of Andrew Garfield, how he has Gwen Stacy and the other two have MJ. You have Tobey Maguire who has the organic web shooters and the other ones don't. And then you have like Tom Holland who's fought like Thanos and he uses nanotechnology and all these type of things. Plus he's fought in the Avengers, which is hilarious because Tobey Maguire had no idea what that was. But you have all these like differences and despite these differences, you still have like that code that they live by where Tobey Maguire says, gotta cure them all, it's what we do right? It's what we do. That right there, like, just hit me on such a level where you, here you have these three Spider-Man, different characters from different franchises, but yet there's that through line, right? And so that's what I really liked about it. So when it comes to the argument of like, oh yeah, it was only like a fan service, it was nostalgia. No, not really. I think I think it, it wisely used its characters. I think it wisely did the callbacks uh, to where it wasn't distracting. But if you are a Spider-Man fan and you're in the know, then you're in the know. I feel like if you heard the, like for instance, perfect example, the callback where Norman Osborn says, I'm something of a scientist myself. If you, if you are not a fan of Spider-Man and you heard that, it, it wouldn't bother you, right? It wouldn't bother you, similar to how it didn't bother you when he first said it in the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man. 
But if you know, if you're like really in, 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 in ingrained into the culture of not only the internet, of just the Spider-Man memes in general, you get a laugh out of that. And so that's a perfect example of a meme that was called back. If you know, you know, if you don't, you don't. And that's it. No compromises there. So I find it, I find it really great how they were able to kind of like weave in and out of these like, oh, you know this character, then you know this about this character. Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield with the whole back situation direct callback with Spider-Man 2 where he fell down like a hundred stories and then cracked his back. I like that type of stuff. It's a celebration of who Peter Parker is. And that's, and that's what's so great about this movie is that it's a celebration of who Peter Parker is. So I made a bunch of theories about this movie and like I theorized things like, oh, Peter Parker is going to have to sacrifice his relationship with Mary Jane because it's based off the One More Day storyline, and that is essentially what happened. And so when it comes to that ending, I feel like this had the best ending to a Spider-Man film because not only like was it darker, uh, but it also pretty much put Peter Parker in a place that I was kind of upset that he wasn't in before. And, you know, when it comes to Tom Holland's Peter Parker, like, a lot of his stories just kind of end on, like, a very, like, happy note. Obviously, there's the reveal of uh, Mysterio revealing his identity and whatnot. But this was a dark ending that put Peter Parker in that space that we know him to be. And that is someone who's bare bones, uh, you know, no technological suit, no backing, like, no no friends, I would say, uh, but he still goes out there every day to save people and help people because that is what he does. Before, he was just kind of like, oh, I want to be a part of the Avengers or, oh, like, you know, I, I need to uphold Tony Stark's legacy. But now it's like Tony Stark, if he was alive, wouldn't remember who he is. Uh, he doesn't have the Stark tech. He doesn't have the backing of the Avengers. Uh, nobody really knows who he is. But somebody like that could easily just start a new life. But instead, he goes out and helps people because that's his responsibility. That right there was probably one of the most perfect Spider-Man endings. It's right up there with Spider-Man 2 as as far as like perfect Spider-Man endings, right? A little Easter egg that I want to point out is that when he jumps out of his window and he's like flying over the Rockefeller uh, Center or however you want to say it. I don't live in New York, so don't come at me. But uh, a lot of people have pointed out that that is the same place that the Hawkeye finale is going to be set. And I made a theory saying that Okay, uh, Hawkeye is set during Christmas. Spider-Man, or at least part of Spider-Man, is going to be set during Christmas as well with Rogers the Musical happening and whatnot. That was tied into, uh, obviously, the rumors that Kingpin was going to show up in Hawkeye and that Daredevil was going to show up in Spider-Man No Way Home. And sure enough, Kingpin started uh, showed up in Hawkeye and Matt Murdock showed up in Spider-Man No Way Home. So that kind of like hit that theory as well. So it's it's cool to think that Spider-Man No Way Home is taking place at the same time as uh as Hawkeye. So that it's really cool to see like these universes like really show some continuity in that way. Speaking of which, we can't talk about spoilers without talking about the Daredevil reveal. Let me tell you, like I was not expecting such a huge reveal to happen so early in the movie. I think it was only like maybe like seven minutes into the movie i was looking down trying to find my popcorn because i put it on the floor and then i heard people cheering and i looked up and it's freaking matt murdoch and oh my gosh like it was just that was probably one of the greatest reveals that the movie could have done because it was just so uh sudden like having the cane just kind of pop out and once you see the cane you know exactly who it is and so like seeing him advise peter was another theory that i had way back when when i said he's gonna need a lawyer for what's happening uh when his identity gets revealed and things like that so it was one of those things that you could easily predict but there's still like a lot of red tape around it because like obviously he's part of the netflix series and when you don't know if they're gonna make those canon or not now we know that uh i still doubt that they're gonna be canon but uh, the MCU is going to pick and choose who they want to put in these universes. And lucky enough, Matt Murdock and Kingpin was chosen to be part of the MCU. So that's really great. I'm excited to see like what stories kind of like come out of that as well. Like who knows, will, will uh, he get his own series or again, or will he get his own film? Or will he appear in a future Spider-Man film? That could be pretty cool. Now let's talk about the villains, okay? So the villains... I've already said, like, uh, the villains had a reason to be there. Like, the villains weren't just kind of, like, pop in and pop out. Like, I, they all had, like, kind of, like, a three-dimensional sense to them. Now, obviously, some villains get more billing than others. Like, Dr. Octopus, uh, Green Goblin, and Electro were way more fleshed out and got way more screen time, way more of the best lines than, say, like, the Lizard and Sandman. Alfred Molina pretty much picks off exactly where he leaves off with Spider-Man 2. Like, it feels like he's never left the character. Like, it, was just, it just seems so seamless for him where, like, I didn't see like i didn't really go like oh yeah like he's trying to capture that magic again no he captures it and he does it really well green goblin however 
he is a scary son of a bitch. Like, I think he was better in No Way Home than he was in Spider-Man uh, 1, uh, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. Because this is a guy that, like, you forget that he has, like, super strength and that he's, you know, he's he's a match for Spider-Man when it comes to fighting, right? So there's a scene, that awesome scene, where Peter is fighting him at uh, Tony Stark's, like, or Happy Hogan's, like, apartment. And the way these two are going at each other, like, throwing each other through walls, throwing each other, like, going from one floor to the next, it was probably one of the best uh, action sequences that uh, Tom Holland Spider-Man has ever been a part of. So I really like that. But then it also showed little peeks into uh, uh, Green Goblin's character where Spider-Man is on top of him and he's just smacking the crap out of him. And Willem Dafoe just looks up and he's laughing. It reminded me of the Joker in The Dark Knight where, you know, Bruce is punching him and he's just laughing. And they're like, there's nothing you could do with all your strength. It reminded me of that, but it still had like a creepier sense to it because this is Spider-Man. Spider-Man literally is trying to pull his punches because he could kill him. But the fact that he's like laughing that I was like, that's Green Goblin. That is the Green Goblin that we know and love. And so that was just like. Super fantastic to see. One other thing I want to say about the villains is that Sandman, I don't know if anybody noticed this, but Sandman, I don't know what the deal was. Thomas Hayden Church, play, who played Sandman in Spider-Man 3, and he comes back for this one. Like, it seems like that they couldn't get him to appear on set, but he still wanted to be a part of the movie. So they just kind of like ADR'd his voice. Like they just got him in like a recording studio and had him record his lines. For the most part, he's literally in his sand form, which is weird because Flint Marco doesn't do that. Or at least that's not what we've seen him do in Spider-Man 3. Like he will always go back to his original form. But when he pretty much like, you know, goes back to normal, I don't know if anybody noticed this, but those scenes are pulled directly out of Spider-Man 3. Like, those scenes are pulled directly out of Spider-Man 3. Like, when he first gets turned back to normal and he's looking at his hand, that is the same exact scene where Spider-Man splashes water on him and he's looking at his hand, right? So, I obviously, I think it's like they, Thomas Hayden Church couldn't come, but he wanted to be a part of the movie, so they just, you know, did what they had to do. But then, like, you know, you just see, you just see like, obvious kind of, like, CG, they CGI'd his character into these scenes, and it kind of looks weird. Like, I know a lot of people haven't been talking about it, but it kind of looks weird. It looks very, very weird. Yeah, it, it kind of like threw me off a bit. Uh, same thing with like Reese Iphens. I think, I, I think, uh, to in order to like keep it a secret, they didn't have him physically appear on set. They just had like you know CGI lizard, and then they had him just kind of like record his lines and things of that sort. And then maybe he did have the one scene where he did turn back because that one actually did look more like it was original for the movie versus like them taking a part of Spider-Man, uh, Amazing Spider-Man and putting it there. So yeah, that, that just really threw me off. All right, so what does this mean for the rest of the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Because this had huge ramifications because obviously the whole world forgets who Peter Parker is. Now I wanna talk about how the spell works exactly, right? So pretty much like the entire world forgot who Peter Parker is. Now, I think the key word, so the key phrase is, everyone in the world, meaning people off world will still remember who Peter Parker is. So Thor, the Guardians of the Galaxy, Nick Fury, uh, Captain Marvel, like obviously they don't know what's going on down on the planet, so that they will still remember, right? Uh, I also think that, uh, you know, when it comes to people on Earth, uh, a lot of people think that it would change the timeline when you need to remember it just erases the memory of Peter away from people's minds. It doesn't change the timeline or anything like that. So I think what will happen is that people will pretty much like similar to in the comics, they will have gaps in their memories where Peter Parker had a direct hand in. Say, for instance, that the Avengers during the battle against Thanos, right? Uh, obviously, Spider-Man had a huge part in that battle. But when the other Avengers now think of that moment, Spider-Man is nowhere to be found. And they probably will like fill in the blanks and say like, oh, Captain America did that one thing. Or, oh, remember where uh, that webbing hit this guy? That probably was Ant-Man or something, right? They would just pretty much not try to think too hard on that because obviously it's a battle and like they don't want to remember every single detail so i think it's going to go like that now if peter parker wanted to say like get a credit card or something his social security number is still in there it's just that the person who's like in charge of like giving those things out would just have to be reminded that peter parker is a person like peter parker is essentially a nobody right so you know all hello my social security number is this and then they'll look and say oh it's right there they forgot Peter Parker existed, but they could always still like kind of like look him up. So I think that's how things are uh, going to be progressing throughout the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's going to be really interesting to see like Peter Parker's story go forth. And like now he's kind of like this separate entity as like Peter Parker really 
always has been right like he he usually teams up with the he's been a part of the avengers but he'll team up with the avengers or team up with the fantastic four and he's like his own thing that nobody knows his secret identity and it just kind of like always irked me that so many people knew peter parker's identity like i i always like hated that trope like throughout all the spider-man films because it's sam raimi's universe green goblin knew dr octopus knew uh every villain knew actually there was not one amazing spider-man Lizard knew. I think I don't think Max Dillon knew, but Green Goblin ended up knowing. Uh, Rhino doesn't know still, you know things like that. And then now with like the Tom Holland universe, Vulture knows, Mysterio knows. Like it, it just it finally gets us back to like the the true version of Spider Man. And speaking of true version, that suit was pretty damn awesome too. That was a pretty damn awesome suit. It's it's we talk about comic book accurate so much, and we always say that with like Andrew Garfield's the most comic book accurate, and then you know. Um, uh, Tom Holland Spider-Man when he appeared in Civil War obviously with some technological tweaks still looks pretty comic book accurate but now this looks comic book accurate it's bare bones no technologies like in it other than the web shooters it's honestly beautiful it was honestly beautiful to see but yeah guys uh, let me know like if you've seen Spider-Man No Way Home what was your favorite part of Spider-Man No Way Home drop it in the comments obviously if you've seen the movie then you're welcome to if you haven't don't go in the comments at all but uh, oh my gosh like seriously we could talk about this like all day I think I'm going on 20 minutes now and it's, and it's going crazy. Uh, also, make sure you guys, you, if you like this video, make sure you hit subscribe. Make sure you hit like. Make sure you hit the bell to get notified for my other videos. And, uh, yeah, you guys, take care.